Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm Daisy Floyd. It's my pleasure to serve as Dean of Mercer University's Walter F. George School of Law, and also my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to the 2015 Walter B. and K.W. Sheridan Lecture on Religious Liberty and Separation of Church and State. This is a rotating lecture, and we're delighted to host it at Mercer University this year. Uh, and we are delighted to welcome Professor Alan Brownstein from the University of California Davis School of Law. This is his third lecture in three days, um, and so he's being very generous with his time in speaking to us this afternoon. And I'm delighted that Betty and Kay Sheridan are here. Welcome, uh, for whom the lecture series is named. Um, we're going to proceed with Professor Brownstein offering some remarks after his introduction by Brent Walker, who is the executive director of the, joint, the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. And then we're going to have brief responses by two of our faculty members, um, Vice Provost um, and former Dean Gary Simpson and Professor Tim Floyd. Uh, and so welcome to you all. Brent, we're delighted to have you here if you would come forward and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Floyd, and it's so good to be here with you today. The Baptist Joint Committee is pleased to co-sponsor with Mercer University this 10th annual Sheridan Lectures on Religious Liberty and the Separation of Church and State. As some of you may know, the Baptist Joint Committee is a Washington-based advocacy group serving 15 Baptist bodies uh, fighting to defend and extend religious liberty for all. We stand in, in that uh, Roger Williams, John Leland, Isaac Bacchus, and yes, yes Buddy Sheridan uh, tradition in Baptist life that goes back uh, more than four centuries now. Uh, the Baptist Joint Committee has been a part of this heritage for about 80 years, and we advocate uh, day in and day out in our nation's capital and really around the world uh, on uh, behalf of religious liberty for everyone, all of God's children, not just for Baptists. We file briefs in the U.S. Supreme Court. We uh, pressure Congress. We advocate in the agencies. We advise the administration. We give commentary to the media. We engage in a variety of, of education projects and administer a state-of-the-art website and web blog. Uh, and you can also follow us on all of the usual uh, social media. Uh, let me invite you to feel free to tweet the lectures using the hashtag Sheridan Lectures, which you will see on the front of your program, or follow along on Twitter at BJC on the Hill. Uh, I want to quickly introduce other Baptist Joint Committee staffers who are here uh, these days. First, Sherilyn Crow, the BJC Director of Communications, over here, and her associate Jordan Edwards who's behind the camera over on this side, Taryn Deaton, our Director of Development in the back, uh, and Charles Watson, Jr., who coordinates our education and outreach, outreach ministries over in the jury box, right? <laughs> we, we simply could not do the good work that we do without the help of these talented folks, and I also want to express my gratitude along with that of uh, D uh, Dean Floyd to Buddy and Kay Sheridan uh, for your incredible generosity that underwrites these annual lecture lectures that go from campus to campus and will in perpetuity. Uh, long after we are all gone, uh, generations of students and others will be able to learn about our first freedom, uh, religious liberty, and be reminded of the need to fight for it generation after generation. Our lecturer today is Alan Brownstein. Uh, a summary of his ample CV is uh, in the program, so I'll be very brief, brief in my introduction. Professor Brownstein is Professor Emeritus at the University of California Davis School of Law uh, and is a nationally recognized constitutional scholar. Uh, the primary focus of his scholarship relates to religious liberty and, and church state issues, but he has taught and written extensively on, on many other constitutional areas. Uh, Professor Brownstein has collaborated with the Baptist Joint Committee uh, over the years on religious liberty cases, primarily through the drafting of amicus briefs in the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court and other courts around the country. And beyond this, Professor Brownstein is a good friend of mine and of the Baptist Joint Committees and a friend of respected scholarship and amiable discourse about the very contentious issues surrounding the establishment of religion, and the protections for the free exercise of religion. 
I'm honored that he was uh, willing to uh, travel clear across the country from north central California, 3,000 3, or more miles here to uh, yesterday Atlanta and now to, uh, to Macon. Uh, so we welcome you to campus, uh, Professor Brownstein. I know that you will find this a, a friendly and eager uh, audience. Uh, we look forward now to, to hearing from uh, him uh, on the, uh, the topic for his third lecture. And by the way, you'll be able to listen to his first and second lectures uh, probably in about a week's time as soon as they get posted on the Baptist Joint Committee web, uh, website if you want to as, as, a, uh, uh, as an adjunct to your, your uh, uh, hearing him today uh, for his third lecture. Uh, but the title of the third lecture is Liberty and Equality Values in the Hobby Lobby and Town of Greece Decisions. Will you welcome with me Professor Brownstein. Thank you uh, for coming out this afternoon to hear my lecture, and I want to thank Walter and Kay Sheridan for endowing this lecture series. I'd like to thank Dean Floyd and the Mercer University School of Law for hosting this lecture, and of course, I want to thank Brent Walker and the Baptist Joint Committee for inviting me to deliver the 2015 Sheridan Lectures on Religious Liberty and the Separation of Church and State. It is a great honor to be a speaker in this distinguished lecture series. Now in this lecture, I'm going to discuss two important church state cases that the Supreme Court decided last term, Burwell versus Hobby Lobby and Town of Greece versus Galloway. Let me start with the Hobby Lobby case. To summarize the facts briefly, regulations promulgated person pursuant to the Affordable Care Act, arguably required employers to provide insurance coverage at no cost to their employees for various kinds of preventive care. And this preventive care included access to medical contraceptives. Plaintiffs, two closely held corporations, alleged that some of these contraceptives operated as abortifacients and that the regulations requiring them to provide the insurance substantially burdened their religious beliefs by making them complicit in the distribution of abortifacients. Accordingly, plaintiffs argued that these regulations violated the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA, which prohibits the federal government from substantially burdening a person's religious exercise unless the government can justify doing so under strict scrutiny review. In a controversial 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court agreed with the plaintiffs that the challenged regulations violated RIFRA. Now, basically, I believe the court reached the right conclusion in Hobby Lobby, but it made several serious mistakes in doing so. These mistakes undermined the persuasiveness of the court's opinion. They helped to provoke a political backlash, not only against the court's holding, but against religious liberty accommodations in general. And they increased the likelihood that the court's opinion will be read more broadly than necessary. The first issue the court considered was whether for-profit corporations are persons with a right to exercise religion protected by RIFRA. Justice Alito begins his analysis, correctly I think, by focusing on the owners of the closely held corporations. The owners are natural persons with a right to exercise religion. RIFRA protects their right to do so protects their right to operate in business in a way that's consistent with their religious beliefs, even if they elect to do so in the form of a closely held corporation. The court should have stopped there and ruled in plaintiff's favor on that basis without ever addressing the rights of corporations 
as independent entities. But the court didn't write that kind of limited opinion. Instead, Justice Alito asserted that a for-profit corporation itself is a person with a right to exercise religion protected by RIFRA. I think that's a mistake. Now, to be fair, this isn't an easy issue to work through. The question of the religious liberty of institutions and its relationship to the religious liberty of the institution's members has been a challenging issue for American law and for church-state scholars since the colonial period. And this problem is complicated by our relative acceptance of the nonprofit religious corporation as a person for religious liberty purposes. But still, I think the court made a fundamental error when it suggested that artificial entities divorced from the natural persons who own or control them have religious exercise rights. Religious liberty is a dignitary right. It's predicated on a vision of what it means to be a natural person, a human being in a free society. Corporations don't have human dignitary rights because they're not human beings. They don't have a conscience. They don't experience guilt or shame. They don't love. They don't die. They will not stand in judgment before God. They were not created in God's image with inalienable rights. I think it's an offensive caricature of humanity to describe corporations as persons with dignitary rights. And if corporations can exercise religion as independent entities, exactly how do they go about doing that? What if the corporation's owners disagree on religious matters? Well, Justice Alito's answer to this question was that corporations have governing structures that allow them to reach all kinds of decisions, including whether or not to donate funds to philanthropic or political causes, or whether or not to engage in lobbying. Alito suggested that corporations can use those same structures to determine the corporation's religious exercise. But this answer opened the door to the argument that publicly traded corporations, as well as closely held corporations, can exercise religion and be protected by RIFRA. Certainly, publicly traded corporations also have government structures that allow them to reach decisions about charitable donations, political contributions, and lobbying efforts. Justice Alito argued that it's unlikely that a publicly traded corporation would assert RIFRA rights, but that hardly suggests that they're not entitled to do so. The court's corporations are persons analysis helped to provoke the significant political back backlash that's been directed at this decision. In part, this is because many people reject the idea that corporations are persons with the same dignitary rights as real people. Perhaps more importantly, this analysis aligned the Hobby Lobby case with the court's highly unpopular decision in the Citizens United case, in which it held that corporations are persons for freedom of speech and campaign finance regulation purposes. Second critical issue the court confronted involved the question of whether the so-called contraceptive mandate substantially burdened the plaintiff's exercise of religion. Critics of Hobby Lobby's RIFRA claim argued that there was no substantial burden here. The health insurance provided by the employer was simply a part of the employee's compensation package, just like the employee's salary. Whether the employee used her salary or her health insurance to have an abortion depended on the employee's independent choice. There was no reasonable basis for arguing that the employer who provided the health insurance was complicit with and morally responsible for 
the employee's health care decisions. Accordingly, requiring employers to provide the mandated insurance coverage could not substantially burden their religious opposition to abortion. The link between the insurance coverage and anyone's decision to have an abortion was just too attenuated to be the basis of a substantial burden claim. Furthermore, the substantial burden language in RIFRA was intended to operate as a filtering screen to limit the scope of the statute. If plaintiffs can argue that they are complicit with any attenuated consequences of their conduct, this screening function would be eliminated and RIFRA would be essentially limitless in its application. The government would have to justify its regulations under strict scrutiny review whenever plaintiffs claimed that obeying the law would make it complicit with some hypothetical and speculative consequence. Now the court rejected this argument and concluded that the challenged regulations substantially burdened the plaintiff's exercise of religion. As long as plaintiffs sincerely asserted that according to their religious beliefs, they would be complicit with sinful conduct if they provided the mandated health insurance, then they satisfied the prima facie requirements of a RIFRA claim. And the court said, the courts have no business evaluating plaintiff's beliefs about complicity to determine if they are flawed, poorly conceived, or unreasonable. I think the court's conclusion here is correct. The critics essentially arguing that plaintiff's religious conclusions about complicity in this case can't be reasonably derived from their religious foundation, the belief that abortion is an egregious sin. But neither the government nor the courts can constitutionally evaluate the logic between religious premises and their conclusions. Interpreting scripture and interpreting its scope is the job of clergy and individuals. It's not the job of courts or government administrators. The critics of Hobby Lobby are correct, however, that this analysis significantly undermines the utility of the substantial burden requirement in operating as a filtering screen to limit the scope of RIFRA because the reach of complicity arguments can extend very far. But the substantial burden requirement would still filter out some claims. Some burdens would just be too slight to be recognized. And further, not all attenuated burdens can be grounded in a complicity argument. If an environmental regulation incidentally increased the cost of a product that was used in a religious ritual, a court might well conclude that the impact on religious exercise in that case was just too attenuated from the challenged government regulation to constitute a substantial burden. Well, if a government regulation substantially burdens a person's religious exercise, then under RIFRA, the government must demonstrate that the challenged regulation is necessary to the furtherance of a compelling state interest. Does the government have a compelling state interest in enforcing the contraceptive mandate? The government asserted a compelling public health interest in requiring employers to, to provide insurance coverage for preventive medicine at no cost to their employees. While Justice Al Alito accepted the government's justification arguendo, he questioned whether the government really had a compelling interest here because the preventive medicine requirements were phased in over time and there were exceptions to their application. I believe that Justice Alito's argument casting doubt on the government's compelling interest is wrong on the merits and it was a strategic error as well. It's common for broad or new statutory frameworks serving important government goals to be phased in or to include exceptions. 
as the government argued to the court during oral argument, even Title VII's prohibition against race discrimination in hiring has exceptions to its application. Does that mean that the government lacks a compelling interest in eradicating racial discrimination in employment in our society? Moreover, Justice Alito's argument would apply not only to contraceptives that might be characterized as abortifacients, it would also apply to all the other contraceptives and all of the other preventive tests and treatments which were required by the mandate. Justice Alito would, in essence, be arguing that the government lacks a compelling interest in making a range of preventive medical care available to workers who would otherwise have difficulty in affording such coverage. That contention is counterintuitive at best. And strategically, Justice Alito's argument about compelling state interest undercuts his claim that his opinion is narrow and limited in its scope. If every law that was phased in over time or contained exceptions to its application was held not to serve a compelling state interest, then an untenably large number of regulations would fail RIFRA's strict scrutiny requirement. Moreover, Alito's suggestion that the government lacks a compelling interest in providing cost-free health insurance for contraceptives helped critics to cast his decision as part of an ideologically based war against women waged by conservative politicians and jurists. So if the mandate furthers a compelling state interest, are there less restrictive means available to the government to accomplish its goals? Put simply, is there a way for the government to accomplish its public health and gender equity goals without imposing so much of a burden on religious liberty? Because the court concluded that such less restrictive means exist, the contraceptive mandate was held to violate RIFRA. Now, I think this is the strongest part of Justice Alito's analysis. The court explains that the government could fulfill its goal of protecting women's health without burdening religious liberty by expanding the accommodation it provided to religious nonprofit employers to include religious for-profit employers as well. Essentially, such an accommodation would shift the cost of the insurance coverage from employers to insurance companies. And under this approach, religious employers would not have to violate their beliefs, and female employees of religiously exempt employers would receive all of the benefits to which they were entitled under the mandate. Now, some critics have argued that this solution isn't as cost-free as the court suggested. There can be considerable lag time before less restrictive alternatives can actually be implemented in the real world. And that's a fair point. Female employees of Hobby Lobby have still not received the insurance coverage that they were entitled to under the Affordable Care Act regulations. But on the court's facts, this is the paradigm example of a situation in which a religious exemption should be granted. If a law substantially burdens religious liberty and religious objectors can be exempted from the law without imposing any cost on third parties or the general public, then the government should grant the requested exemption. This would be a win-win situation for both religious liberty and the government's interests. Now, Justice Alito also suggested that a more controversial, less restrictive means was available to the government. He said, if the provision of cost-free medical contraceptive coverage was so important, it was such a compelling state interest, then the government could accomplish its goal without burdening religious liberty by paying for the coverage itself out of the government's own resources, out of our tax dollars. Now, I don't challenge the idea that protecting rights under RIFRA 
or protecting rights more generally may require the expenditure of public funds. Rights are, rights are often expensive political goods. And indeed, as a general matter, I think government should spread the cost or burden of protecting rights as widely as possible when it's able to do so. In an important sense, rights are public goods, and the cost of protecting them should be borne by the public at large, not by some narrow constituency. My primary criticism of Justice Alito's argument is that it provided no guidance for courts to use in determining when the cost of protecting rights would be unacceptably high. Perhaps the least persuasive and most disheartening part of Justice Alito's opinion is his attempt to convince the polity that his opinion is a narrow and limited one. He argued that other insurance cases, such as claims involving immunizations, might come out differently because they're justified by different compelling interests and may involve a different analysis of less restrictive alternatives. But pointing to different compelling interests in immunization cases does little to distinguish them from the court's reasoning and holding in Hobby Lobby. The court assumed in Hobby Lobby that the government did have a compelling interest in providing contraceptive insurance coverage, acknowledging that the government also has a compelling interest in providing insurance coverage for immunizations doesn't distinguish Hobby Lobby at all. In both cases, the compelling interest requirement of RIFRA would be satisfied. The least restrictive means analysis might be more important in adjudicating other insurance cases. But Justice Alito doesn't explain why the same less restrictive alternatives that the court identified in Hobby Lobby wouldn't apply in an immunization case as well. Why couldn't the government shift the cost of insurance for immunizations from the employer to the insurance company? Why couldn't it pay for the cost of the insurance itself? Justice Alito's failure to meaningfully address these questions provides scant assurance to critics who are concerned about the scope of the Hobby Lobby decision. The court also responded to the dissent's concerns that an expansive interpretation of RFRA might require exemptions from anti-discrimination laws. These criticisms were unfounded, Justice Alito explained, because the government has a compelling interest in prohibiting racial discrimination in hiring, and Title VII's ban on race discrimination in hiring is precisely tailored to achieve that goal. Again, this is tepid assurance at best. It says nothing about RIFRA claims challenging anti-discrimination laws protecting women, religious minorities, or gays and lesbians in the workplace. Nor does it say anything at all about RIFRA claims challenging prohibitions against discrimination in places of public accommodation. The court also failed to explain why it believes that laws like Title VII prohibiting racial discrimination in hiring are sufficiently precisely tailored to serve a compelling interest. Why are the exceptions to Title VII acceptable while the exceptions to the contraceptive mandate undermine the government's justifications for the regulations? Now the court's failure here is particularly distressing because it's so obviously unnecessary. The court could have easily written a narrow opinion explaining why RIFRA claims challenging the contraceptive mandate are entirely distinct from RIFRA claims challenging civil rights laws. The contraceptive mandate involved payments for insurance coverage. This is a distinctly fungible benefit that could be easily, equally effectively provided by multiple sources, private employers, insurance companies, or the government itself. Anti-discrimination laws are very different. Here there is the unavoidable psychological harm of being victimized by discrimination. Also, for example, if a woman is subject to discrimination in hiring by a religious employer, 
who doesn't believe that women should work outside the home. The federal government has no obvious, feasible, alternative means available to it to provide comparable employment opportunities to women subject to such discrimination in the community in which they live. Clearly, the least restrictive means analysis is much more problematic in cases involving civil rights laws than it was in Hobby Lobby. The court should have said that, and it didn't. So the court could have written an narrow opinion in the Hobby Lobby case. It failed to do so. And that failure, I believe, has contributed to the heated criticism the opinion has received and has contributed to increased opposition to religious liberty and exemptions in general. I have to drink some water before I go on to town of Greece. Now let's turn to the town of Greece decision. Let me be really blunt and honest and state at the outset that I think this is just a terrible decision. I can't think of anything positive to say about it. I'm not at all enamored with Justice Kagan's dissent either. The decision has to be pretty bad or I don't like either the majority opinion or the dissent. For over a decade, the town of Greece invited guest chaplains to offer state-sponsored prayers at the beginning of town board meetings. During this entire period, the town's prayer program almost completely ignored the religious equality and religious liberty values that are protected by the religion clauses of the First Amendment. And in town of Greece versus Galloway, the majority of the Supreme Court upheld the town's prayer practices against an establishment clause challenge in an opinion that was equally dismissive of the religious liberty and equality principles that were at issue in this case. In my judgment, the religious liberty concerns here were glaring. At the beginning of board meetings, invited clergy asked residents attending the meeting to stand, bow their heads, and join in collective prayer. Plaintiffs claimed that this practice unconstitutionally coerced individuals to participate in a religious exercise. Their argument could hardly be more persuasive or more compelling. Put simply, when government officials are empowered to exercise discretionary authority over individuals, these officials, directly or through invited clergy, cannot request that individuals join the officials in prayer before a decision of importance to the individuals is reached. A judge can't ask attorneys and litigants to stand and join him in or her in prayer before the trial begins. Or the government decision maker could be a public employer evaluating job applicants or determining promotions. It could be a teacher supervising and evaluating public school students. Or it could be a town board making administrative and legislative decisions involving small groups in the community, particular neighborhoods, or individual residents. In all of these examples, if the employer, the teacher, the judge, of the, or the board, in their official capacity, ask citizens to pray, this request is intrinsically coercive. Citizens will naturally feel compelled to comply in order to avoid alienating government decision makers who have so much discretionary authority over the citizens' interests. And this kind of state coercion of religious exercise violates the First Amendment. Now, the court's first response to this argument is to characterize the town's practice as legislative prayer. Then the court explains that there's a long tradition of Congress and state legislatures beginning their sessions with state-sponsored prayers. The court recognized this historical tradition and upheld these legislative prayers in a case called Marsh versus Chambers in 1983. In town of Greece, the court argued that the analysis and holding of Marsh 
is controlling, and it required upholding state-sponsored prayers at the beginning of town board meetings. But the Marsh decision and the tradition of state-sponsored prayers before Congress and state legislatures has little relevance to religious coercion claims directed at local government bodies. The Marsh decision didn't focus on the coercion of members of the public viewing sessions of the state legislature or Congress from the visitor's gallery. There wasn't any reason for it to do so. The prayers offered by the Nebraska legis uh, legislature that were upheld in Marsh were internal matters that were directed to the legislators themselves, not to the public. More importantly, visitors in the gallery of state legislative sessions are there as passive, anonymous observers. Legislators are rarely aware of their identity or their presence, and there is no interaction between the public and decision makers. The situation is entirely different when prayers are offered at a small town board meeting. Here, the meeting rooms are small, much smaller than this room. Few residents are in attendance, far fewer people than are in this room. The audience sits in close proximity to the board, first couple of rows, and the audience is very visible to the board members. This is not anonymous seating in the legislative gallery. And the citizens who, atten who attend town board meetings are not there as passive observers. Nobody goes to a town board meeting just for entertainment purposes, <laughs> just to see what it's like. They attend board meetings to participate in government by speaking to the board during public comment periods. Their goal is to influence board members. Their goal is to petition their government. And further, while state legislatures and Congress typically enact general laws impacting very large groups of constituencies, town boards regularly deal with issues affecting small groups, neighborhoods, even particular individuals. The problems addressed and the limited number of stakeholders make these decisions distinctly personal to those residents whose interests are at issue. Because of these differences, the decision in Marsh tells us very, very little about the coercive nature of government-sponsored prayer at town board meetings. In this latter context, citizens are coerced when they are asked to stand or otherwise affirm a prayer that is being offered in their name. Failure to comply would risk alienating the very political decision makers who they hope to influence. Now, the court responded to these arguments by denying that the town of Greece's prayer practices were coercive. In defending that conclusion, Justice Kennedy interprets social reality in a way that's very difficult for me to accept. In fact, it's very difficult for me to even understand. First, Justice Kennedy argued that the principal audience of the prayers offered by guest chaplains wasn't the public, it was the town board itself. That contention makes no sense. The guest chaplain at a meeting stands with his back to the board, faces the audience of town residents, like I'm facing you. He asks the audience to stand, bow their heads, and join him in prayer. The audience responds by doing so. The chaplain often offers the prayer in the name of the public audience. But Justice, in, Justice Kennedy insists that the prayers were directed at the board members who were sitting behind the chaplain and not to the public audience he was so obviously addressing. Next, Kennedy argued that the prayer practice wasn't coercive because no one would notice if a, dis if a dissenter left the room when the prayer starts, and even if they did notice his departure, no one would be offended by his conduct. 
Now, I've been to lots of local government meetings, and Kennedy's description is bewilderingly wrong. The audience at these meetings is often so small that it would be impossible to fail to notice when someone left the room when a prayer was offered. And any normal person would worry that if they left the meeting when a prayer was offered, or when people were asked to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, or for the National Anthem, that both the board and the audience would be offended by their conduct. Kennedy also maintained that if a person stands when the prayer is offered, no one would perceive their conduct to suggest participation in the religious exercise or agreement with its content. Again, that conclusion simply makes no sense to me at all. People aren't always asked to stand when prayers are offered. And when they are asked to stand, most people feel that doing so has religious meaning. Why would anyone doubt that such conduct suggests participation and acquiescence in the religious exercise? Moreover, for religion clause purposes, the public's perception of a person standing while a prayer is offered is only part of the analysis. Equally, if not more important, is what the person standing understands this conduct to mean. For many people, standing while a prayer is expressed constitutes the exercise of religion. In many faith traditions, prayer involves more than words. Physical movements and posture play an important role in the act of worship. Standing is a particularly meaningful posture for prayer in many religions and would be understood to be part of a religious exercise. When a person is required to stand while a prayer is recited, they are compelled to engage in a religious exercise, and coercing religious exercise violates the Constitution. Then a town's prayer practice is also violated religious equality principles. Since I want to allow some time for responses and for Q&A, I'm just going to discuss a few of these concerns, but that doesn't mean that the concerns I'm going to describe are my only problems with the opinion. There are plenty of other equality concerns that I won't have time to get to. Virtually all of the clergy invited to offer prayers were Christians affiliated with organized religious congregations in the community. A majority of the prayers offered were explicitly sectarian in content. The prayers were typically offered on behalf of the audience in the community, not as an expression of the prayer offerer's personal beliefs. Both the selection process through which individuals were invited to offer prayers and the content of the prayers they expressed undercut or violated religious equality principles. Non-Christians lived in the town of Greece. Jewish residents worshiped in synagogues and adjoining communities. Buddhists and members of the Baha'i faith lived in Greece as well. And surely, as is true throughout America, some people living in the town held spiritual beliefs but did not affiliate with any organized religious congregation but only Christian clergy from organized congregations, with rare exceptions, were invited to offer prayers at meetings. To put it bluntly, the town's invitation process treated non-Christian and non-affiliated residents as if they didn't exist or were unworthy of notice. The court's responses to this challenge are not only unpersuasive, they're a virtual recipe for religious discrimination. First, the court argued that the town didn't need to go outside its borders to invite guest chaplains to offer prayers at town board meetings. Second, it claimed that the low-level functionaries charged with issuing invitations to offer prayers without any guidance at all may have been inept in doing so, but it's not unconstitutional to be inept and incompetent. And the court said plaintiffs admitted that they couldn't prove intentional discrimination against religious minorities. Third, since the board insisted that it would have allowed people of any faith and no faith 
to offer the invocation at meetings. They had only asked to be invited to do so. The court said that obviously there's no discrimination in this case. Anyone of any faith or no faith could have been invited to offer these prayers. Now, these myopic answers not only shield discrimination against religious minorities from constitutional review, they provide a blueprint of how to do this. Outside of big cities, it's common for religious minorities to establish a congregation and a house of worship in one town in order to serve the spiritual needs of adherents who live in neighboring communities. Under the court's analysis, minorities who worship in adjoining communities need never be invited to participate in public prayer programs, never. The court's attempt to blame the town's decisions on the incompetence of low-level staff is even more disturbing. When constitutional rights and values are at issue, the courts have emphatically demanded that the government operate under carefully structured and transparent guidelines to limit the risk of biased decision making. Leaving decisions to inadequately guided petty functionaries has always been considered a constitutional problem, not a shield for discriminatory results. Vesting discretion in unsupervised staff in these situations virtually invites discrimination. And the absence of guidelines makes it difficult for a court or aggrieved parties to determine when discrimination occurs. That's why in free speech cases, for example, courts insist that permit decisions must be governed by clear published guidelines. Confronted with an ad hoc process, it's no surprise that the plaintiffs in town of Greece elected not to pursue their claims of deliberate discrimination. And most bizarre of all is the court's reliance on the town's purported policy of adding anyone who asked to be included to the list of guest chaplain invitees. The list was open to everyone. But this policy wasn't published anywhere or announced to anyone. Now, how can a selection process not be discriminatory if organized Christian congregations are invited to offer prayers, and non-Christian minorities and non-affiliated residents are supposed to guess that they could invite themselves to do so. The content of the prayers offered also raised equality concerns. Collective we prayers that purport to speak for everyone in the audience or the community inaccurately presume religious homogeneity and ignore religious differences. Combined with the town's discriminatory selection process in the town of Greece, such prayers reinforce the town's failure to recognize the existence or worth of non-Christian residents in the community. The majority opinion in the town of Greece is a terrible decision for anyone who cares about religious liberty and religious equality. We can only hope that it's given a narrow interpretation in future cases. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of my discussion of Town of Greece that I wasn't enamored with Justice Kagan's dissenting opinion in this case either. But let me clear that I consider Justice Kagan's dissent to be vastly superior to Justice Kennedy's majority opinion. <laughs> However, there is something inexplicably missing in Justice Kagan's criticism of the Town of Greece's prayer practices. To Justice Kagan, the constitutional problem with the state-sponsored prayers in town of Greece relates exclusively to religious equality concerns. She says almost nothing about coercion and the impact of coercive prayer practices on religious liberty. And her failure to discuss coercion and religious liberty is particularly odd in that many of the powerful examples she uses to illustrate her arguments are so obviously coercive in nature. Justice Kagan argues, for example, that it would violate the Establishment Clause if the presiding judge, immediately prior to trial, asked the minister to come forward to invite the attorneys and litigants to rise and join him in prayer. 
She eloquently insists that an individual seeking benefits or services from the government or seeking to influence government decision makers can't be asked to pray before government officials or a member of the clergy invited them to offer a state-sponsored prayer. But Justice Kagan never takes the next step to argue that the problem with such prayers is that they are coercive in nature and abridge religious liberty. Instead, she describes the problem entirely in religious equality terms. Individuals asked to pray in these situations must either subordinate their beliefs or publicly set themselves apart from the majority on religious grounds. These prayers are constitutionally invalid because they operate as an instrument for dividing religious minorities from adherence to the community's majority religion. The problem with Town of Greece for Justice Kagan is that sectarian prayers offered by clergy selected through a discriminatory invitation process in the context of a small town board meetings align the state with a particular religious creed. Now I agree with Justice Kagan that the Establishment Clause requires more respect for religious equality than the town board in Greece offered. But in my judgment, the town of Greece is also a religious liberty case, raising very serious concerns about religious coercion. And Justice Kagan's dissent doesn't address that issue directly at all. And that's why I have a problem with it. Thank you. I have litigated cases arising under the First Amendment, and I've, I've been involved. And, but I, gotta, I think my perspective here is as a person of faith who has deep theological commitments to the principles of religious liberty and to the work that the Baptist Joint Committee does. Uh, and that's the perspective I just wanted you to understand from which I speak today. Um, I, I do appreciate following Professor Brownstein. Um, he wonderfully captures the problems of, of the slippery slope in the Hobby Lobby case. The, the potential reach and ramifications uh, of that are, are kind of mind-blowing, and they're also so unnecessary. As he so clearly pointed out, the court could have and should have based its decision on narrower grounds. I think Professor Brownstein was, at, his, at least to me, most persuasive and most eloquent when he insists that only natural persons may exercise religion. Corporations don't have a conscience. They, they don't have experience guilt or shame. They don't love. They don't die. They won't stand in judgment before God. They were not created in God's image with inalienable rights. That's what he just said a moment ago, and all I can say to that, if I may say so, is amen. <laughs> um, I, I think recognizing the religious rights of corporations is indeed a slippery slope, and it's not clear at all uh, how that right um, can or will be limited uh, to just to closely held corporations. Now, for that reason, as much as I admire what Professor Brownstein said across the board, I think I part company with him when he says the case was probably rightly decided. It's a close call for me. Um, Professor Brownstein very persuasively says that the court if it's going to go in the direction it did, should have recognized the free exercise of rights of the individual owners of these corporations and their choice to do business through a closely held corporation. And if you're going to protect religious exercise here, it's their religious exercise, not the closely held corporation. I certainly agree that would have been a much better outcome. But, but even the narrow ground that Professor Brownstein suggests, I think ultimately is still problematic. The problem is that the Hobby Lobby owner's religious exercise does impose significant costs on third parties, in this case, the employees. This is a national corporation that employs over 20,000 people. Um, it's, it's closely held, to be sure. It's one family that owns the company, but it has enormous reach. By recognizing the owner's religious exercise in this business, I think we come dangerously close to to the notion from 16th century Germany at the time of the Reformation Wars where they reached this compromise in the Latin which was quius regim is religium. That is, the religion chosen by the, the sovereign will be the religion of the people who live there. 
I know that's not really what we're talking about. It's a bit hyperbolic, but I do worry about the rights of employees in, in a situation like this. If we're talking about a nonprofit corporation that's religiously motivated, that's okay, uh, requiring that kind of homogeneity. But for a, non, uh, a for profit company that operates in the commercial sphere, um, I'm just worried about it. I think it would have been much clearer just to draw a line and say if it's a for profit corporation, uh, we're just not going to recognize religious rights even of the owners. Um, part of the problem, though, you know, is that in this case is that we rely on private employers in this country for one of the most important public goods, right? Health insurance. Uh, and even in uh, what some people falsely say is the new socialized medicine of the Affordable Care Act, we're still relying upon private um, employers primarily for health insurance. That's a historical accident in this country, and it's, but it is a political reality. But I guess in the meantime, all I'm suggesting is we really should acknowledge the cost to employees, especially women, if the religious beliefs of a handful of employers trump those of thousands of employees. As the town of Greece, boy, on this one, I, I just agree with everything Professor Brownstein said. I, I could sit down, and maybe I should, but give me just a couple of minutes for what we call in my faith tradition a personal testimony. Um, the problems of official publicly uttered prayer at gatherings of religiously diverse audiences is a personal issue for me. As a person of faith, I find the kind of generic non-sectarian prayer pretty problematic. The, the prayer to whom it may concern, that's really not a problem at all, right? But worse than that kind of generic prayer, and it's much worse, is a narrow sectarian prayer at a religiously diverse gathering. So in a former life, when I worked at a state-supported university, I very publicly opposed the student initiative to have public prayer at our graduation. I was crit criticized quite roundly by the students and by a good many members of the public for being in opposition to prayer at graduation. But, but here's an irony, and some of you already know where I'm going on this. Here at Mercer, uh, is, is I have become really the designated prayer at, <laughs> at law school events at graduation and other situations. Uh, in fact, a few years ago, a relatively new employee, uh, right after I'd given a prayer at some kind of function here, came up and said, ask if I was an ordained minister. And, and I said, well, well, no, I just play one at the law school. <laughs> <laughs> well, have I changed my mind about public prayer? Well, no, not really. Certainly in any government-sponsored function, I, I would still insist uh, that we should not have um, coerced prayer. Of course, we don't have constitutional issues with prayer at a private school, especially one in the Baptist tradition. Did I get that right, Craig? Um, st still, Mercer is a religiously diverse place, and the issues of community and coercion are just as real here, in a lot of ways, at, at a public institution. Is it possible to offer prayers to a religiously diverse audience that are non-coercive, inclusive in nature, respectful of religious diversity? I'm not sure. Uh, I've tried. <laughs> I, I think it's worth the effort. I really do believe that such prayer can solemnize an occasion, to use the court's awkward language. They, th such prayers can remind us of abiding realities greater than the mundane task at hand. And I, I do believe the world desperately needs more interfaith understanding, respectful dialogue across differences, especially religious differences. And it may be that non-coercive, inclusive prayer can assist with that goal. But I'm not the best judge of that. I mean, after all, I'm a Christian. I'm a Protestant Christian in the heart of the Bible Belt. I may not be the best judge as to the non-coercive nature of my prayers and whether my words are perceived to be inclusive. I'll have to leave that to others. Thank you. Hi, well, I'm, I'm delighted to be asked to, to comment. Uh, Professor Brownstein and I are probably among a small group of academics who I would characterize see a strong role for both free exercise and the Establishment Clause. So I'm going to raise some questions and concerns that I have, but I think it's, it's probably fair to say that uh, most people, most academics, and certainly a majority of the Supreme Court would kind of look at where he and I stand on things and say, I can't see the difference. Uh, you're both way out on this one end of a, of a spectrum, uh, at least where the Supreme Court stands today. Uh, let me 
say a couple of things about the Hobby Lobby, just to put it in context, and, and I do come out differently, um, the, and part of it is because uh, if you see this case in context, it's a very aggressive reading of free exercise, and, and the court does it because they're not really interpreting the free exercise clause. They're interpreting the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, and then when they say, well, co corporations, uh, or at least closely held ones, are included within the coverage, uh, they, they refer to the Dictionary Act, which is part of the, the U.S. Code. Uh, so they're not really giving us a, a decision on what you might call constitutional free exercise grounds. Instead, they're interpreting this Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So let me just give you a brief sort of overview, uh, because I think their reading of it is, one, I think it probably violates the Establishment Clause, and secondly, I think it's perverse. So you can see I really like it. Um, the... Um, I mean, what the, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, was basically an, an attempt by Congress to undo a Supreme Court decision in 1990 uh, that pretty much gutted the free exercise clause as it had been traditionally interpreted. So free exercise had been understood up until 1990 as a basis for arguing for exemptions based on your religious beliefs. Uh, the Supreme Court in 1990 pretty much said, uh, they almost claimed we never have done that. That was simply not credible, but they said we're not doing it anymore. Uh, we're not carving out exemptions based on people's uh, free exercise claims. Uh, and they had a couple of little exceptions just to leave standing a couple of cases that, that I think people would have flipped if they tried to overrule them. Uh, Three years later, the Congress of the United States virtually unanimously uh, tries to reverse the Supreme Court, okay, and, and they pass the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, several years after that, the Supreme Court struck down the Religious Freedom Restoration Act as to state and local government. So the, the act that we're looking at here is it's, it's, it's sort of a, a, you know, a, a shadow of what was passed by Congress, uh, and basically it applies to federal government because there's different reasoning that can be used to justify that as opposed to state and local government. But basically we've got a Supreme Court here sitting uh, deciding the scope of a law uh, that uh, really is only existing now in part. Uh, the, what, what the federal government was not allowed to do here a state government could do any time it wanted. Uh, there would be no Religious Freedom Restoration Act applicable because it's state government. If they want to impose requirements, they could do it. And what's striking to me here is you've got the Supreme Court saying to the federal government, you can't do this because we're reading this act of Congress, uh, the same body that passed the uh, Affordable Care Act, we're going to read this in the strictest way we can. Uh, and I really think that's what they do. They give this very expansive reading to persons. And then the means end relationship, and I disagree a little with Professor Brownstein here, if you look at Supreme Court decisions interpreting the free exercise clause before 1990, they never applied the means end, least restrictive means test nearly as strictly as they do here. In fact, they tended to apply it with a certain amount of deference to the government, particularly if it was the federal government. So I, I'm not sure what we're looking at here. It's the same people who wanted to strike down the Religious Freedom Restoration Act as to state and local government, who were now insisting on the court, read it for all it's worth, give it this very aggressive reading, uh, and I don't know if it's sort of sticking it to Congress. I'm not quite sure what the purpose of the majority opinion is, but the opinion's really an outlier. This is n not how free exercise has ever been interpreted, and they're careful to say, well, we're just interpreting this Religious Freedom Restoration Act and interpreting it in a way that I don't think it, it, it was never intended for that type of interpretation. It didn't pass almost unanimously in Congress uh, on the thought, on the understanding 
that it wasn't going to give any latitude to the government to say, we think it's an important reason, we think this is a good fit, we can't carve out exempt exemptions here. And there's a whole case law that really supports it. So again, I think it's, it's kind of puzzling. And reading free exercise as strongly as they do, my view would be, I think they've now stepped over the establishment clause. I think they have given free ex so much weight to the rights of Hobby Lobby here uh, that basically they've created an establishment of religion problem. They favored religion in a way that they shouldn't. Um, let me give you my equally moderate analysis of um, the, um, the town of Greece case. Uh, I think the, the, the problem in, in at least understanding town of Greece is it sort of starts on a premise that's, that I think is wrong. Uh, and that is that legislative prayer uh, is consistent with the Establishment Clause. That's sort of the, the place they start. They say, well, we had this case 30 years ago. We're not going to revisit it. Uh, everyone, even Kagan, acted like she thinks Marsh, this case about legislative prayer, was rightly decided. I don't think she really does, but I think she, for purposes of argument, was, was acting that way. I mean, Marsh, this case in the early 90s about legislative prayer, approved legislative prayer as consistent with the Establishment Clause almost exclusively by relying on history. And they said, look, the Congress that proposed the First Amendment in the same year in which they proposed the First Amendment, I think in the same month, uh, they also provided for a paid chaplain for Congress. And they said, well, that pretty much settles the question. What are we talking about? Clearly, they thought legislative prayer was consistent with principles of non-establishment. Uh, well, I mean, that argument, I don't think, was a very persuasive one, even though a majority of the court, I think it was a six to three majority, accepted it. Uh, the fact that something was passed in 1789, I think people know from Marbury against Madison, uh, that doesn't immunize it. Uh, Marbury struck down a part of the Judiciary Act of 1789. So the fact that Congress did something back at the time of the framing of the Constitution doesn't settle its constitutionality. In fact, if you look at legislative prayer, I think there's good reason to think that what Congress did was actually very reflexive. Legislative prayer had existed previously. They were continuing a tradition where did they kind of have a blind spot? Did they not recognize that legislative prayer, in fact, would, is a problematic regime? Uh, and I think today we see it even more clearly with a more religiously diverse society. I don't think they were putting their stamp of approval on legislative prayer saying this is consistent with the First Amendment. I think they were just kind of reflexively perpetuating a tradition that had been in place. Uh, I think it's a perfect example of what you talk about in constitutional interpretation, the difference between the specific intent, what the framers might have been thinking about in terms of particular things at the time, and the general intent. What were the purposes they were trying to perpetuate when they adopted the Establishment Clause? And I think a purpose, and this isn't going out of line with the Supreme Court, a purpose was non-endorsement of religion. Uh, I think that purpose, as understood, means you don't have legislative prayer. Uh, I don't think there's any way that's not an endorsement of religion. Okay, thank you. I want to thank our speakers and thank you all for being here. Professor Brownstein, are you willing to take a few questions? Sure. Okay, okay. Are, are there some folks who have questions? Um, some questions? Yes. Kagan's dissent was the, um, not addressing this idea of coercion. Um, why do you think it wouldn't be necessary to prove actual coercion? Why is this assumed coercion of the situation enough? Why wouldn't the, the plaintiffs in a, in a case like this have to show that 
when they went to the town meeting, the town board actually decided against them because they refused to credit. Well, basically, because it's extremely difficult to prove that, uh, because the board is exercising discretionary authority, and there will almost always be arguments on both sides, and trying to prove that the board was invidiously motivated to retaliate against people because they didn't stand uh, and express a prayer would be uh, an almost impossible burden uh, to satisfy to in most cases. Um, and I think most of us accept the idea that there are circumstances that are intrinsically coercive. I mean, uh, if you become a lawyer and you're representing a client and the judge, who's the presiding judge at a proceeding, uh, tells you to stand up and join him or her in a prayer before the proceeding begins, are you going to feel pressured to comply? <laughs> Is your client going to feel pressured to comply? And if you lose the case, do you think you'll be able to prove that you lost the case? because you failed to stand up when the judge asked you to pray. That's the problem. <coughs> uh, with regards to the Hobby Lobby case, uh, Could you speak just a little bit louder? Sorry, uh, in, in regards to the Hobby Lobby case, uh, I think that um, there's 20 contraceptives that were listed uh, for uh, 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 provision to be, put, to be yeah. paid for by the insurance, and um, Hobby Lobby specifically took issue with four of them. That's correct. Uh, so I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on whether or not uh, the fact that Hobby Lobby was not pushing for uh, full exemption from all contraceptives versus only the four that they believed were uh, abortionary and informed, if, if that might have been a deciding factor in the quarter. Did that have any weight at all in it? I really don't think so. Um, I think in the court of public opinion, it's certainly much easier uh, to explain <coughs> opposition to abortion than opposition to contraception. Uh, the problem is that virtually all of the court's arguments would apply in exactly the same way to a religious objector who protested uh, supporting any of the contraceptives that were on the list. Uh, indeed, any of the preventive care treatments that were included uh, in the, this mandate. Um, so, you know, Kennedy certainly mentioned this as, uh, you know, this is like abortion that they're protesting, but I really don't think it was a persuasive or dispositive factor to the court. Mm -hmm. One more question. Yeah, so I was wondering in the, the town of Greece, the, uh, you were somewhat dismissive, well, I'm kind of putting it lightly, um, <laughs> of the, uh, the court's uh, claim that you could just leave and then come back and no one would know. And I think that's, I think you're correct that that seems just silly. But having been to a lot of local town meetings myself, I regularly skip the entire first half because it's just insanely boring. <laughs> and I show up and no one seems to care that I've shown up late. So if the court had ra rationalized it in that way, would you find it more persuasive? Well, I mean, some people do that. Uh, some people wait until their agenda item is going to come up, and they show up for public comment then. Uh, there are issues where you want to express your views in public comment before your agenda item uh, comes up. And in fact, public comment involves comments on things that aren't on the agenda at that meeting. At least in California, you can say anything you want to during the initial public comment period. Uh, but also, I go to a lot of local government meetings first. I want to get there before the meeting starts. I want to see who else is there. I want to know who the opposition is, who's going to talk. I want to pigeonhole someone on the board with a city council before they get up onto the, the dais uh, to explain my views, because I'm only going to get two minutes to talk during public comment. So I think uh, being there in the beginning is really a politically salient time. I think it's of considerable value to people who want to try to influence the board. Uh, so I think you can avoid some of the problems that you describe by just waiting until your agenda item uh, is called. Um, but I have to admit I'm a little bit offended uh, 
by the idea that religious minorities have to wait in the hall until their agenda item is called before they get to walk into the building uh, to express their comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for being here. It's, it's always a tough duty to cut the conversation off when it's getting so interesting. Uh, we do have a small reception in the hall outside. You're welcome to stay. Please join me again in thanking Professor Brownstein and our other panelists. <laughs>